again. You gotta let it go, let it go, let it go. I'm feeling so cold that my heart just got frozen. Gotta let it go. So here you, you're supposed to cut me off. Here I am. Hello. hello, hello, gentle viewers. We're here with, um, I believe, episode 19 of Maze Cast, but we're going to be looking at room number 18 because we're feeling a little contrary today, and we're going to be continuing with the Halloween theme of the month. We're going to be looking at what I think is one of the very spookiest rooms in the entire maze, which is room 18, otherwise known as the fireplace room, the one with the big, scary fireplace dude uh, who's just staring at you all, terrifying like. So uh, there's been a lot of discussion about this room, a lot of recent discussion, and a lot of um, past discussion, and we should, uh, I think, just go through and recap some things and maybe see if we can bat around some new ideas. So I am Beals, otherwise known as Andrew, and with me, as always, is my good friend Greg. Otherwise Hi. Known as Greg. And um, so, yeah, I think, uh, is there anything you want to say before I just sort of launch into it? No, that's gumption. I like how you're ready to just go and plunge into this, this very spooky room here in this October 19th. Let's do it. All right, fine. Fantastic. Um, so, let's see. Well, uh, this room, actually, I should have looked this up beforehand. Do, 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 do. This room, uh, well, if you're looking at it from an abyss uh, perspective, this room is currently listed as a two star room. And there's one confirmed solution right now, which I think is really. Um, Probably one of the most elegant solutions that I think anybody has found in the whole um, the whole maze so far. I think this one goes back to the days of the John Bailey site, and it concerns the um, the musical notation over the doors here. Now, uh, of course, we are in the loop here, and uh, the ideal door to exit would be door 13, because if you were to go through door three, you would sort of get sort of uh, wound into the uh, the inner circles of the loop, and you'd be meandering for quite a while, and pretty much the only way you could get back out onto the main ring of the loop and return to room one would be to get to room 13 anyway. So uh, clearly room 13 is a preferable choice here, and the, the solution, which I think is so strong, um, concerns the notes over the two doors and how we are supposed to interpret them based on the cleft marks on either side. So. The um, the the first of the four of the four panels, the first one depicts the bass clef or F clef symbol, um, which lets us know that we should interpret the two notes over room 13 as being in the bass clef. Whereas next we have the G clef, the treble clef marker, um, which tells us how we should interpret the notes over door three. So when we look at the um, the two notes over door 13, we see that they are in in bass clef uh, C and A, with the idea being that those are alphanumerically the third and first letters of the alphabet. So we just flip it around a little bit, and we get 1 and 3, 13. So it seems like a really strong correlation. Compared to that, uh, the, the chord over door 3 could almost seem to be complete gibberish. In fact, it's not really. It's, um, as I think uh, Contiki and Vince have been, and um, Mr. Gentile have been hashing out lately, it's actually an inverted C major chord. And so you could maybe you could maybe spin something there about how since it's C, again, you have uh, the number three. But my, my instinct is to think that Manson probably didn't intend for us to do any kind of musical sleuthing uh, in quite that degree. I think that we're just uh, expected to understand that the, the first and third letters over 13 form a much stronger connection. And so we should use that to hone in on that as being the correct door. Could I ask a question um, about Matthews? Um, yeah. I, I haven't been tracking what's been going on at the abyss. Um, so has there been any suggestions as to why the notes are flipped like that? Yeah, people, I was, I'm glad that you asked that. People have been sort of um, curious about that because it does seem as though the most intuitive way to do it would be to just put them in the order of A, which would be the lower note, and then C, which would be the upper note. Um, and so, actually, I think you yourself, um, you yourself, uh, suggested that maybe the ordering of C A is supposed to the beginning of a sentence or the beginning of a phrase. 
see a, as in do you see a something? This was a while ago. I can still swear to that, but uh, I think you you could you could struggle to maybe fill something in the blank there. Um, and so that's one possible way to deal with the the seemingly reverse order. And then another, um, let's see, another thing that uh, I thought well. I do have another possible idea as to what's going on there, but maybe I'll get into that a little bit later. It ties into the um, the bowling pin. Okay, cool. I'll I'll say one thing about that. So yeah. if the, the other the the configuration above three is actually a, a C chord, I if if that's the case, I think it's probably the case. So there's got to be something else in the room that maybe it maybe this has to do with your bowling pin that says why we should switch those, or why we should go for the one that's kind of written backwards. Uh, anyway, I'd, yeah. I'd, this, is, this is news to me that that C major chord is there. Yeah, um, it, the, the notes are, for anyone who doesn't know, the notes are from bottom to top, E, G, C, E, which uh, is an inverted, um, yeah, it's an inverted C major chord. Um, and so since it's C, and since C is letter number three, there does you could argue for there being something there. I still maintain that that could be a little bit um, too much for me to expect his readers to know about musical theory and that he maybe just wanted to squash in a, a big, scary chord to make people realize, no, this can't be correlated to C in the same way that, uh, that A and C correlate to 13. But uh, you know, as we discover more about that chord, um, there could be more intention there, but it just seems a little bit of a reach for Manson to explain. Uh, people to know, like, um, the short stories of Edgar Allan Poe, you know. Uh, yeah, I, I guess you're right. I, mean, I think there's, there's a very simple solution to this room that doesn't require any musical knowledge at all as well. But, um, you know, you said it was an in inverted C major chord. What's that? Uh, I wish I could tell you more exactly about this because I haven't studied music theory since high school and I, I forgot a lot of it. But um, I think basically the idea of inversion is that you you take uh, you take the upper two notes and you sort of you move them down into the next octave down. And um, so what would be well, it's close to that. Maybe maybe it's modified a little bit more than that. But I think the basic C major chord would be what C E G C, I suppose. And instead, we we right. shift some of those notes down, and we we start instead on E, and we have so instead of having a C to C, we have an E to E, but it's still considered a C major chord. It's just inverted. Because um, uh, that's that's very striking to me. That so we have we have the notes above thirteen, which are reversed. Yeah. Right. We have an inversion of of the C chord. Yeah. Right. Inversion is kind of like a reversal in a different dimension. Yeah. Exactly. They're both kind of reversed in a way, and I feel I I don't think that's going to be a coincidence. I mean, there's there's a reason he picked the notes he did there. Um, I I don't know what else to say about that except that I that seems like an eight-legged chair to me or a nine-legged chair. There's something there. Uh, but go on. I just wanted to stop you there because that that seemed interesting to me. Yeah, yeah. It's still something that uh, is continuing to be discussed um, until now, and uh, probably. Probably we'll figure out more about it um, as more as more people who are more knowledgeable about music theory weigh in. Um, so yeah, it's a bit of a hot topic right now. Is seeing if there's more to unpack there. Um, so let me see. What else we've got. Well, um, oh yeah. So still still staying on the subject of these uh, musical of these staves over the doors. Um, a question arises, and I think it was Vince who first verbalized this question, uh, which is why uh, could there have been any intention behind the decision to have the staff over door 13 kind of slanting downward and have the staff over door 3 slanting upward? And Vince tossed this out there. Uh, it didn't ge generate much discussion, but he made what I thought was a pretty interesting correlation, which was that he correlated it with the slats on the backs of the two chairs. And we can see we have um, the chair that's positioned right in front of door 13. You have uh, the slats that are running in a downward slope from our perspective, um, much like over door 13. And in the other chair, we see the darker slats that are running upward from our perspective, uh, as in the uh, door 3. And so he tossed that out there. Um, 
I think he did almost all of the work. Maybe, maybe he could have gone even further to say what he probably thought was just too obvious to say, which is, oh, this is a, a light versus dark thing again, where we should pick the, the lighter chair, the, the one that uh, uh, yeah. illuminated by the fire from our perspective. So we should pick that one, so we should pick 13 instead of uh, picking 3. Maybe that was all White Raven wanted to hear or, or whatever, but um, that seems like you could go all the way with that and make that a pretty coherent argument because it does... I, I do really like the correlation that he noticed between the the two distinctly different angles of the staves versus the two distinctly different angles of the uh, slats on the backs of the chairs. Uh-huh. So that's another interesting thing that's been... I think, I think that particular point... The shadows dance across the floor in with that as well. Yeah. So. Yeah, there's been... Yeah, that, that line... We'll have to come back to that. That line has been... Uh, people have tried to do a lot with that line. So, and here's another. Let's 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 throw out another. Um, a very big point uh, that's often taken as I'm not sure that I agree with it personally myself, but it seems to be becoming sort of received knowledge about the room, which is um, that when you look into the exposed uh, passageway beyond the curtain of door 13, the open curtain, uh, you see that it's not in fact just sheer darkness, uh, but rather you can make out sort of this sort of this perhaps peel, uh, it suggests that there's some kind of additional hanging, um, and people have suggested that perhaps the idea here is that this is actually an extra curtain that you're supposed to duck behind, and so uh, this... this came that. And it says that in the, the text there, ducking behind a curtain and hurrying down a passage. That's, that's the simple solution to this room. You don't have to know anything about the music. You just read that last line, you see there's a curtain there. Um, it's just if you if you can see that curtain, you see that's the way to go. Well, I disagree because the curtain over uh, room three would work just as well. Um, I think Vince Vince so you don't step behind it in the same way. It's a half curtain, so you literally duck to go underneath it. Um, yeah, that's 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 the sort of thing that has been said, and that does make it seem rather stronger. I personally, uh, I guess we're probably going to want to agree to disagree on this, but I personally have always had a hard time seeing that as a curtain. I report this theory, but to me that looks more like something that's affixed to the wall, like a poster, a peeling poster, or a peeling bit of wallpaper. I find it a little bit hard to so see. The, you see the rod? Look at the curtain rod. You mean okay, the curtain rod? The curtain rod, 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 rod for door 13? Yeah, so if you look at the left of that, you can see the rope for the curtain. If you look to the left of the rod? Yeah, well, the left side of the rod. So I'll kind of point here. I don't know if you can see this. Right there, there's a rope. And that's, that rope is holding up the curtain. Holding up the curtain that the, the curtain that we all see, the foreground curtain, right? No, no it's holding up the black curtain, because the curtain we all see is pulled to the side. It's not are connected. You, are you sure that this is a rope and not just a ring where the pole is fastened into the wall? It looks like a rope to me, like it's going down to the curtain. But that that could just be we're seeing things differently too. I do. Um, it does sort of have little. It has little uh, segments. It has little lined off segments that do kind of suggest a rope. So maybe that could be a rope. I never saw it that way. I thought it was just sort of the, like the fastener where where. It yeah. Is. I never thought about it that way. You could be right because now I'm looking at at uh, the curtain to the left of it, that's in the unmarked door below the base cleft. Right. That also. To kind of have a, a thing like that. Hmm. But then the, like the other one, the one underneath the G clef, it's harder to see. So you still you still could be right about this. Yeah. I'm not quite sure, but anyway, yeah, that's a big that's a big idea. It's not one that I personally feel is great about, but uh, it it definitely merits mentioning in any discussion of this room. So, and was there anything else that I really wanted to say about that? Um, no, not particularly. So, so another big topic that's come up recently that uh, I should get into is the bowling pin, um, which has generated a bit of discussion lately. Um, uh, Hidden Mystery made a suggestion that I actually think is pretty solid. Um, he then seemed not to understand why people were talking about musical notation, so he lost points there. But uh, he made a suggestion that I, I kind of like, which is that he took the hat, he took the uh, very brightly illuminated brim of the hat as an O, uh, which is really easy. And then he combines that with the bowling pin 
to form O pin, which of course in many American dialects, including sort of my own, um, it's very hard to pronounce O pin and O pin differently when you're O pen, O pen differently oh. when you're speaking normally. Um, and so he thinks that that's a fair. He thinks it's fair to therefore combine them in that way and form the word open, and therefore take that as a clue that we should go to the uh, the door with the visibly open curtain. Um, and there's. Uh, I'm sorry. What was that? And that would mean the line. Um, someone's lost his hat. Are you sure it's the hat that is lost? It's the O that's lost from the pin. Oh, interesting. That's that's one way to look at that. That's one way to read that text. Um, because like anytime you have kind of you're just combining two elements in the room, you kind of want something to back it up, and oftentimes that's, that's going to be in the text. Um, exactly. Uh, this I, is, the, this is one of the, this Go is on. the pushback that uh, that hidden mysteries idea has gotten um, that. Some people, such as Vince, feel that it's just sort of too arbitrary of a combination, although Vince himself then said, well, in room 45, there's quite a lot that sort of seems arbitrary at first glance that you have to combine. Um, so so there's perhaps some precedent for that. Another bit of feedback, another bit of uh, sort of pushback has come from people such as Contiki, um, and other people have mentioned this idea as well. I think perhaps Janice, way back in the day, um, suggested that maybe the hat should just be taken as a hat and combined with the pin to form a hat pin. But nobody really has any idea uh, what to do with that. Uh -huh. So that's that sort of idea it hasn't really gone anywhere uh, for the time being. But um, basically, as I said, I do I do like um, in Mystery's observation because I really do feel that that uh, the the O that you see you can't unsee that O from the hat. It's just so much more brightly illuminated, and it's not really consistently illuminated with the rest of the hat. You would su you would suppose that perhaps the bottom sort of half of the brim would be darker in the same way that the bottom half of the whatever you'd call it, the pipe of the hat is, uh, and instead it's all very bright and really leaps off the page. And one thing that I was thinking is that um, perhaps this is supposed to be a little bit of a red herring for us that we're supposed to see that O oh, and um, what I mean to say is perhaps if somebody has started to realize that the rooms on the path uh, are supposed to cue us for particular letters, somebody might see this and be deceived into thinking that this room is on the path. And so... Um, like some ultra-meta trickery there. Yeah, it just seems... You, you can really do something with that brim of the hat as being an O. Um, perhaps there's more, more to be said on that front, but... As far as the bowling pin, another thing, oh, well, well a couple of the little things about bowling pin. One is that um, I think it was Vince who suggested, um, he just threw out there, there's not really anything there, but I just figured it was worth mentioning the, the fact that the curtain for door 13 is pinned back, we might suppose, and then we have the pin there. Again, some weird ideas about what to do with this word pin, um, but one thing that I think um, definitely merits discussion is the just the mere presence of a bowling pin and the fact that he chose a bowling pin to give us this word pin as opposed to other like safety pins or that kind of thing. Um, the choice of a bowling pin seems very deliberate when you look back at room 8, um, which has, I think, I don't know how much you agree about this, but I think it's starting to become accepted that there's a, a distinct bowling theme there between not only the bowling pin itself, but the bowling Alex pin. Alex was doing that, I remember. I'm sorry, what? I remember Alex was big on that. Um, I think about it too. Uh, the other thing I was going to say is the candlestick suggests candle pin bowling. So I think uh. That, uh, whether or not it was part of any solution, uh, I think could be still. Uh, people have tried to stretch some really uh, some some tenuous solutions out of that. But I think that just as an aesthetic, as a choice that he was making in terms of uh, laying out room eight, uh, I think that there was a deliberate sort of bowling. Uh, motif of bowling flavor, bowling miasma. So this bowling pin here is pretty obvious. It's a pin that's three letters. It looks like a one, one, three, boom, 13, move on. Oh, okay, all right, got it. <laughs> I was going to say um, in room eight, the other interesting thing to say about the placement of the bowling pin there is that it's right by room 31, which is not the correct, uh, right by door 31, which is not the correct door to take by any means. But it's interesting that you see uh, in room 8 a bowling pin standing by door 31, and here you have a, a bowling pin standing by door 13. And that, that was... That's good, yeah. 
That was actually what I was going to say could be, I mean, maybe just to have a little bit of fun and throw a little bit more interconnectivity uh, in between the rooms, uh, that might have been why Manson chose to order those two notes as uh, CA rather than AC, because uh, look at it and you can get 13 out of it, but really, sort of literally, it means 31. And so you actually have two doors in the maze that are marked 31 and have a bowling pin sitting next to them. So <laughs> he may have, just, he may have just tossed that out there as a fun little connection. Well, there's something there, definitely. That's great. Um, yeah, it's a possibility as to why the as to why the the notes are reversed. Yeah, that's really fun. Um, so let me just check on. Oh yeah. So no, uh, go ahead. I, just, I was still just gonna go. No, it's it really just jabbering. Go 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 for it, please. If you want to say anything from my work. If you want to say anything else about the bowling pin, go ahead now because that's all I have let to say. Go, let it go. <laughs> All right, so um, so uh, here I'll just move to another, just a few sort of miscellaneous observations. Um, people have people have tried to do a lot with the shadow, the very long shadow that the that the chair in the middle of the picture casts over the right of the picture. Um, there's a lot that you can try to make there. Um, people have definitely sensed that there could be some letters in there. Uh, you can really see an A very distinctly. You can also pretty easily make an E or an F or other sort of straight line letters that you want to conjure up out of that. And so people have batted that around, not really gotten anywhere with it, but I think it's worth, worth mentioning. Um, another, uh, other things that people have tried to do with the shadows include maybe trying to read those four long lines as also being a musical stave, although you would really need five lines. And Vince suggested, you know, maybe if he wanted us to do that, maybe he could have given the bowling pin a long shadow to go along with that and make a fifth line. But since he didn't do that, and since we only have four lines, probably there's nothing to find going down that route. Although um, another musical idea that Alex actually sent to me uh, just this evening, um, he, he thinks that, uh, again, this is very sort of uh, not, not fully formed, just an idea, but he thinks maybe you could see those uh, four lines as forming the, um, the strings and the fretboard of a guitar. And he thinks maybe you could get somewhere with that in terms of the musical notation that's so important in this room. Um, and there's viol. The kind of, you know, viol. I'm sorry, what? It wouldn't be a guitar. It'd be a viol. Oh, the 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 guitar. That kind of bass-like thing. Guitars have to have five strings. I forget. Guitars have six strings. Six strings. Well, fuck me. Yeah. Um, no. Well, but, the, uh, the violin surely has four strings. I'm not making that up, am I? No, no. Violin doesn't. And the viol is the four-stringed instrument that's in. Well, the violin's in here, too. Viol's in 36, which 36 right. is what you have in this room. Um, violin, there's one in 33, is it? Yeah, as in a sign. Oh, no, actually, yeah, the, the one that's actually in there. Um, yeah. That could actually be a viol, too. It doesn't it, really say it's violin. And uh, it's the curious three-string violin, which I thought was a pointer to room three. Um, but oh, yeah. yeah, if violins are classically supposed to have four strings, then again, that's, yeah. that's something you could do there with a stringed instrument and a fretboard, and maybe you could somehow turn that into some kind of supporter of the musical notation or some related puzzle. But again, that's just very, that's very, uh, very much a fledgling idea. I'm just throwing it out there. Um, as for some other things, well, let's see. Um, we've got from Vince. We've got shadows danced across the floor to the fires music. Um, he, yeah, the, the shadows are the effect. The, the fire is the cause. So that's why I don't think the the, the shadows are going to be an instrument. Oh no, I'm not. Yeah, I'm moving away from the. I'm moving away from the visual depiction of the. Uh, I'm just thinking of that connection with that. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. My first thought wouldn't be to go for an instrument for those shadows because the shadows are dancing to the fire, which is making. Um, oh, so you go you, on. You're, Drops and Vince. Yeah, this is um this is an unrelated this is an unrelated point to the visual shadows. Vince just threw out that um the if we're supposed to be looking at the fires music, he takes that as perhaps a a pointer to the that we should be paying attention to the music in the F clef. Fire giving us F. So we should oh. look at um, room thirteen rather than room three. 
So that's just another small observation. Um, another one that Vincent Gentile tossed around, which I think is pretty good, is that um, we have a much warmer room, and we've already seen in, what was it, um, is it room three? No, I think, yeah, it is room three, isn't it? With the, um, the backwards, forwards, uh, stop pots room and so on. We've seen, yeah. and I, accept, I think this is pretty good, that you have sort of a warmer, colder uh, idea going on there that's supposed to cue you to the right door, uh, which I, f I think, in fact, is this one, isn't it? It's uh, one door 18. Yeah, one door 18. Um, and so Vince and Mr. Gentile suggest that we should also here be picking the warmer door, which is the door that's closer to the fire, which is door 13. So that's just another little thing. Um, we have a couple of things from Contiki. Uh, we have Contiki noticing that the both in the first paragraph and in the last paragraph of the text, we have 13 words, um, which he thinks could be a pointer to 13. White Raven liked that observation, but thought perhaps it wasn't really motivated enough. Uh, we didn't have enough of a reason to sense that we should be counting words. Um, but I think it's worth throwing out there. Another thing that Contiki, um, another thing that Contiki noticed that White Raven thinks is on the right track, not quite there, is uh, he noticed that the um, the two columns that are uh, flanking door 13 are much better lit than any of the other columns in the room, whether they're closer to or farther from the fire. And we've seen that light and dark obviously can uh, play a big role in some of these solutions. Um, so there could be something there. I'm not really sure how to follow through with that or add to that, but um, it seems that if White Raven has a solution in mind uh, concerning that, um, it seems as though that's the case and that we just need to uh, work on that a little bit more to get something out of there. Um, and so I want to talk about the dragon, but I won't talk about the dragon. I'll, I'll, I'll save that for last. I, um, I'll share my own new solution first. Um, here's something that I found. Uh, people have tried to do very, very many things concerning the two chairs. They've tried to count ones and threes all over the place as much as they possibly can with the posts and the slats and uh, supporting you know, horizontal posts of the chairs and everything. And uh, all throughout, I've always thought that it was a little dodgy because you really have to come up with a very rock solid one to three to avoid just falling into a three and thinking, okay, how is Manson supposed to expect us to get three, uh, get one three instead of three out of that? So I've been pretty dissatisfied with most of the solutions that have concerned trying to do things uh, like counting things with the chairs. But uh, I found something that uh, that I think is really pretty solid, and I want to, at the risk uh, at the risk of, uh, of crashing, I feel sort of Alex levels of confidence in this one, and uh, I want to maybe see, Greg, if you can, if I if I sort of nudge you in that direction, I want to see if maybe you can find it. Um, okay. Would sound good to you? So uh, take a look at the, take a look at the middle chair, the one that's in front of door 13. Yeah. So if I told you that I see a letter of the alphabet in the seat of the chair, would you be able to find which one I'm thinking of? Uh, maybe. Let me look. Uh, I could see some possible letters. I, I'm probably not seeing the one you're thinking of. I could, I could see a V, maybe? You could justify a V. The one that I'm thinking of is an X, because it an seems you're supposed to see two diagonal lines. Yeah, I can see the X too. This happens that with the shading it's a little bit indistinct. But uh -huh. it seems to me that if you have an X, if you can find an X in here, what else would you be looking for in this chair? Um, well, X is a 10, so you could look for a 3. If you're yeah. trying to do that. So you could maybe just sort of follow up the chair. And see the three slats on the back? Slats. I think that that's an X and a one one one. So uh -huh. I think that's a thirteen, and it's it actually resonates with the Kumbhakarna also gave us Roman numeral thirteen uh, in the wooden in the wooden post upholding the statue. I think that's pretty solid, doesn't it? Yeah. It's just another nice hidden number. Uh huh. So uh, yeah, no, that's good. So I think that that's well done. Uh, yeah, I think that's that's worth posting. Um, and that's pretty much all I have to say about the chairs. So the um, 
So yeah, pretty much the last topic, the only final topic that I want to address in this recap is the dragon, which people have thought a lot about because it's such a distinct element, and yet it seems very hard to um, fit into any kind of... It seems hard to make it interact with anything else. Um, I don't know if... Uh, at first I thought maybe it was just chosen because... Just chosen as sort of a little joke because the, the mouth of the fireplace is literally breathing fire, so we get a dragon. But, um, but people have made suggestions for more meaningful things, at least concerning the shape um, people have noticed that the shape is very symmetrical between the neck and the tail. They seem to go together, and they almost seem to want to go together to form a figure eight. And if the dragon were biting his tail, then we would get a nice figure eight. Um, and so people have tossed this out. Uh, I, Kontiki, I should credit that to Kontiki. I believe that he uh, was the one who most, uh, most, uh, most thoroughly verbalized that idea. And it seems to me that that's very interesting. It seems to um, resonate with the image of the broken key in room 38. We had a broken key over there that was a map, and we have over here a broken figure eight. And it would be really cool if, um, if the loop were shaped like a figure eight, or if this room were on the path. I think you could see that as possibly a very deliberate, similar idea. Unfortunately, since the loop isn't actually a, you know, an infinity symbol, uh, if, or there's no way to map it, that's satisfactory like that. Um, there's probably not anything there, but uh, I just wanted to toss the dragon out there because it's definitely... It can't just be a totally arbitrary design. I mean, it's, it just seems very thematically meaningful, and it seems to have some distinct choice going on in the shape that seems worth, worth dwelling upon. Well, in light of your chair solution, um, could you find a, something that looks vaguely like a 1 next to that 8 shape? Because we're in room 18 right now. So it could be that you're thinking, oh, that looks like an 8 if I turn it sideways. And then, oh, you see um, deals an X with the three 1s next to it. That's very possible. That's very possible. You could justify, I mean, you could, I don't, I don't, I don't want to say justify. That's a strong word. You could, you could throw out a, uh, a 1 being either of the wooden, um, the wooden uh, pieces of the panel that that are surrounding the the dragon uh, that doesn't seem very strong, but uh, I like the idea. Um, it would be awesome if there were a, if there were a clean one somewhere in there. Yeah, because people do people do want that to be an eight. They want it to be. We've talked about how like you could break up an eight into a one and a three by like just carving off part one half of it and straightening out into a line and leaving the rest of the curves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a reach. I mean, people have people have tried to do a lot, and so that's the, <laughs> the final in this in this room that's really hasn't got a whole lot going on in it. Um, that's you haven't said point. anything about the face. I mean, you got your finger on the pulse of the face community. Don't people have anything to say about that gaping face with its missing tooth? Uh, oh yeah, the gap. Well, yeah, I could I could talk about that. Um, one thing that people have talked about with the face is that. Um, uh, people have recalled from their high school music theory days the, the mnemonic uh, F-A-C-E, which on the G clef... Um, face is spelled face. Clef. Sorry, what? Face is spelled face. Yeah, that's, that's how you spell it. You spell it with, uh, with the letters F-A-C-E, in fact. And those are, the, those are the notes that are in between the lines on a G clef stave. So... Uh, the the line the the notes that follow the lines are what e g uh, b d f but um, yeah f the top f but in between them you have uh, starting from the bottom and working up you have an f an a a c an e so again people are people people have have corroborated this with the with the musical notation solutions. It seems a little strange that that would fit with the G clef, considering that that's the one that we're supposed to avoid. Although you could just say, you know, this is a scary ass face. We tend not to want to go near fire. Uh, so if this is supposed to lead us to the G clef, that should be a pointer away from the G clef. And then and as you point we have out, a, set, a set of assumptions: one that you want to stay away from what's warm, and another one that you want to go towards what's warm. That's true. That's a bit of a conflict. You probably don't want to accept yeah, so it. If you just come up with these assumptions to do this or that, um, you get a little lost. Maybe. Yeah, you don't want both of you wouldn't want a you wouldn't want a set of solutions that would try to incorporate both of those because that would be that would be weird. So perhaps there's nothing to that face thing. Perhaps it's just a coincidence. Um, but another thing that people have talked about 
is, as you say, uh, people have mentioned the gap in the teeth. People have pointed out that the teeth look a little bit like the keys of a piano, which could again fit the music idea. And yeah, people have observed the gap, uh, not been able to do a whole lot with it, as far as I know. Uh, perhaps you have something you want to say. Perhaps you have something you want to say about the face generally. No, I don't. I don't. Um, you just were going through all the different elements, and kind of the you know the the elements of the room that draw your eye the most are the dragon and the face, and, and those seem to be um, the ones people have the the least to say about. Yeah, it's curious and spooky. Uh, White Raven, I mean, I know that you're not very, uh, you know, you don't hew much to the abyss, but um, I thought I should just throw this out there. White Raven uh, has has said that metaphor, he, he put down metaphor as being the number one um, class of puzzle solution. He says that more of them function, like he, I think he counted more than 40 metaphoric solutions. I don't know how much uh, any of us would like all of those, but um, but it seems to me that perhaps the face and maybe even the dragon um, are more supposed to function on a metaphorical, more of a thematic level than anything else, um, as opposed to more, uh, more um, fine, uh, more more uh, granulated solutions such as the the musical notation solution. And uh, yeah, don't really know. I don't have any personal take on the face at this time. Right on. Should we go so, through the text? Do you want to talk about the text? Yeah, we can move on to the text. That's pretty much all of my recap. All right. That was good. You were very comprehensive. Yeah. In fact, I, I was so comprehensive that I'm starting to lose my voice a little. Do you want to uh, read the text for us? I'd love to read the text. Please. All right. We start with an ellipse, like we often do. A much warmer room. So let's talk about that sentence. I I always thought that was a routine and it's towards heat. Um, I think it's one of the instances where the rooms talk to each other. Um, saying, kind of saying, you got it, guy. You got it. You picked the right room when you went to 18. This is this little, little bit of um, encouragement. You did if you came from room three. Again, if yeah. you were following the warmer, colder thing. Um then you would know that you'd made the correct choice there. Yeah. Yep, yep. Um, and you had said something else about that line, a much warmer room. Oh, the, the door closest to the fire would be the one yeah. to go. Just That's a good idea. Good. Go around. Seems pretty yeah. straightforward. Right. Right. Oh, and oh, here's interesting. Okay, so have you ever played that game, Hot or Cold, where you're trying to find something, and it's you're getting warmer, getting warmer, if you get, if you're getting closer to it, and you're getting yeah. colder. That's that's the uh, that's the um, that's the reasoning that's been discussed in room three. The idea that we're supposed to go to the warm water of the radiator and the sun, uh -huh. and we're supposed to go away from the cooler water in the pots, and oh, I really am losing my voice, and the colder moon as well. Um, right. So yeah, that can be very, very definitely brought up uh, in relation here. But here, so uh, there's actually connections with within this text, so there's all this stuff about things being lost um, mm -hmm. later on in the text, and we'll get to that. So maybe there's a connection there between the getting warmer and someone's lost something, or something's lost. Yeah, it's curious because, um, yeah, this is, a, this is an idea that I just find very amusing. Um, I feel like I couldn't find it anywhere mentioned in the abyss, but uh, it, it's not my own idea. Somebody has mentioned this before. Um, the, uh, the, the interpretation of the um, well, I'll hold off on that. Maybe you want to keep reading. Okay. It, it involves uh, text later on, so I shouldn't, I shouldn't jump right in there. Okay. Does it involve a much warmer room? It does not involve a much warmer room. Okay. We'll move on then. Let's do that. Shadows danced across the floor to the fire's music. Now, this is a particularly uh, poignant line that seems to, uh, that you want to read a lot from. Um, yeah. And it's the only one that really mentions the fire, too. Okay. Feels like it should tie in together the whole room because it's got fire, it's got shadow, it's got music, exactly. which is kind of the, a lot of the big elements there. But um, again, like we've already kind of talked about this line, not a lot's been made of it. Um, I, I, probably there's a solution that takes us from that to to door thirteen, but um, 
yeah, people have people have done a lot of thinking about that line. We're still we're still not there yet. Yeah. Um, someone's lost his hat. It's interesting. We don't know who said that. I guess it's one of the visitors. Um, so if someone's lost his hat. There's a hat there, and I th I'm going to just go ahead and keep reading because I think these lines are very connected, and it's kind of hard to talk about yeah. one without talking about the other. Um, are you sure it's the hat that is lost? I asked reasonably enough. No one would answer me. Okay, so the guide is implying that something else is missing. So we have we have a number of things that are missing here. We have the top of the face's head. Um, we have the dragon is potentially lost if he's turning in on his tail. We have um, the tooth that's missing. Uh, it could be that bowling pin <laughs> that's lost. Where's my alley? Where are the gutters? <laughs> my nine friends. Um, we have top hat uh, who could be lost. You know, he lost his hat, um, and you know he's running around the maze. Um, another thing about that hat, it's pointing towards thirteen, so that could be like a indicator of top hat's path. You know, how there's kind of a series. You can kind of trace top hat's running through the maze. Um, top hat the man, not top hat the hat. Um, of course. But that's, well, yeah, this is where I wanted to um, this is where I wanted to mention another another rather amusing and also disturbing idea that uh, that I see that I've heard suggested somewhere is that perhaps the man who who wore the hat uh, was actually swallowed up into the fireplace, and so he was lost in that way. Um, oh, is um, what did I? Why did I want to say that? I wanted to say that because because <laughs> it's scary to get burned alive. And it's spooky. That's... It's October. Um, ah, one of them was a man who caught flames. Well, he was engulfed. He was swallowed right up. Uh, no, the the interesting thing there is, um, you would I guess you would sort of have to discard that idea if you wanted to, um, if you wanted to go with your whole warmer, colder thing. Um, if if going closer, you have two different ideas here. You have the idea that going closer to the fireplace is warmer. And it's therefore closer to being on the right path, but with that little, with that little uh, amusing uh, short, scary, short, scary story idea, um, you have uh, going closer to the fireplace means that you are closer to becoming lost, as in you're uh -huh. to somebody that is going to be spoken of as lost, a lost soul. Um, so that's just that's just another way of thinking about the um, another way of thinking about the fireplace as being something. Dangerous, rather than something that you want to um, approach, um, or or maybe it's something a matter of moderation. You know, you you want to be kind of midway between the fireplace. You want to be warm, but you don't want to be hot. I um, want to be like Icarus. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You want to sit in that chair right by thirteen because that's the you know a good length, a distance yeah, from the fire. Warm your toes up a little bit and then carry on. Um, an overlooked line in this series, that someone's lost his hat, blah, 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 is no one would answer me. That seems like a line that could be, um, could be I mean, it says one. Seems like it's, it's one of those lines that uh, seems, seems like it might be sneaking in a clue. Um, you know, most of the stuff is about what's lost, you know. But the fact that he mentioned that no one would answer him... Uh, could very well be a clue in of itself. Um, yeah, it's a good line. It's very atmospheric. I haven't thought of it as being uh, potentially supplying a solution, but um, it's very possible. I will say that uh, it is tempting to tr pull that one out of the text uh, and get the one that we need for 13, but um, I think we've seen that it's a little hard to draw the line when you start going down yeah. that uh, you you don't know which rooms to apply that logic to and which rooms not to apply that logic to because words like you just one. apply it to every room. That would all work. Ones, all circles are zeros. Perfect. Great. Oh, how about um, how about stripes on couches? Could they also be ones and zeros? Yep, they okay. are. Not could they are. Got it. No, I shouldn't. I shouldn't have. Uh, I shouldn't have been too shy about that. I should have known better. Yeah, you know, you know, you, you know, Maze. Uh, so no one would answer me. Me rhymes with three, one three. There you go. 
Um, ducking behind a curtain and hurrying down a passageway, we came out in, and I, you know, I think that that's pretty solid with the curtain solution, but I, I, I'm, you don't see it, and that's, I think that's, it's surprising. I kind of thought it was obvious, but now that we have talked about that curtain, I can see how it might not be a curtain. It could be something else. It's just, um, yeah, it's hard for me to see that as being something that's hanging down in front of the passageway that you therefore need to duck beneath. It just seems like, well, I don't know. Maybe I'm being stupid because I guess the way I've seen it as a poster or a bit of wallpaper would require that the the angle of the wall be rather, rather... Be like... The, <laughs> the off at a pretty remarkable angle, um, which doesn't really jive with the, the, the other doors that it's sitting alongside. The one interpretation there could be that, well, nope, I'm going to revoke that before I even say it because I don't think, yep, revoking that comment before I even say it because uh, that would have been really stupid. So, yeah, I guess maybe it's harder to defend my idea that it's something attached to the wall of the corridor. It's just how I've always seen it. It's, it's hard for me to see that. I guess maybe, I guess if it were, if it were hanging sort of parallel or closely parallel with the, the, the curtains that we see, I guess I would want to see more of the, more of a vertical line distinguishing uh -huh. well, it. Oh, I see. Yeah. Well, it's not—it's not hanging flush because it's—it's it's like instead of being draped over the rod, it's tied to either end, so it's kind of got this bowing. You can see that in the line, like it—if you imagine it being, uh, you know, hung up on a rope to either side of the rod, right? It—it it makes sense that it would—it would be in the shape that it is in. Um, yeah, but well, it would be—it's harder. To imagine what? Well, I guess here's another here's another thing that um, that has made it hard for me to accept it as a curtain is that that bit that bit that seems to taper upward. Am I wrong about that? It seems like it curls upward or it peels upward, which at the bottom, yeah. I mean, the only I think the only way you could justify that with the curtain is if it were like hooked at the bottom on that side and hooked at the top, like it were hooked. Not at the top on both sides, but at the top and the bottom, and then it were like, pulled up by the rope. It seems a little convoluted. Yeah. No, you could but, be right. You could be right. I'm, I'm less sure of that solution having talked to you. Um, oh, oh, no. I'm sorry. No, no that's okay. That's okay. I'm less sure of, I'm less sure of my less sureness, so I think this was probably a very productive maze episode. Yeah. We're both more wishy-washy than we were before. Fantastic. <laughs> Where are we going to be? I really think it's not good to be too certain of things. Um, well, I guess not. Except for Fable. We can be certain of Fable. Fable. Oh, right. Yeah, that's the right way to go. That's just about the only one. Something else, you know, speaking of Fable, something else I was going to say is that uh, I'm going to make a little personal confession here. Uh, I, I respect, but I have never loved the solution in... 26 that, and this is related back to 18, I'm going to relate this back to 18. I've never loved the solution in 26 that hinges on reading the bell as giving us a zero. Um, uh. I really think that this, the brim of the hat here with the lighting and with the much wider uh, shape of the brim, uh, I think that gives us a much more solid O slash zero slash ring or whatever else we want to do with that than the the, the well in 26, but that's just my personal opinion. Uh huh. Fair enough. Fair enough. And um, yeah, I don't know if we're missing anything. It seems like we've we didn't talk about logs at all or and irons. Yeah, people have talked about the logs. I don't. I'm not really feeling the logs, but people have talked about the logs. People have tried to count the logs. People have tried to make 13 out of the logs somehow, which is hard because there are five of them. So you can't really say that there's three and one. Actually, there are six. The hat is resting on the sixth, isn't it? So. Yep. So there's a lot of pairs of threes in this room. You could say that. Yeah, there are a lot of clusters of three. Um, and it's the sixth tooth that's missing. Well, I don't know. 
Um, oh, sorry, which tooth do you think is missing? The sixth. You want to the left? The one right in the center? Well, it's not in the center. It's the sixth one. There's there's nine teeth. There's five on one side and four on the other. So if there were ten teeth, it would be the sixth um, one. Expecting an, right, you'd be expecting another one on the very far... On the faces, on the right of the face as we see it, you would be expecting one more tooth down in there. Yeah. Well, that might have been just a face thing, but um, I suppose there could be something there. I think you can actually see the gums. If you look closely, you can kind of see it's not, it's more than just kind of a, oh no, that's a tooth. It's just a shadow, and, and never mind, I'm babbling. I sort of saw what you saw, but um, but yeah, that could just be shading. Yeah, it's shading. It's, yeah. All right, well, I think we we covered it. Um, we didn't We didn't solve all of your fears, but hopefully we've illuminated some more of this strange and spooky world that is the maze. Um, and I, I don't know whether or not the more we learn, whether that is actually more comforting or whether that um, just helps us know how much more we don't know. And that yeah, makes it helps us, uh, helps us comprehend the Lovecraftian monstrosity that we are truly face to face with here and helps us, helps us sort of realize how how very uh, helpless and and just completely vulnerable we are in the face of this sheer cosmic terror that is this book. Yeah, but even as we are um, kind of doomed in a way, it's kind of nice that we can just on occasion find a nice warm chair and have a seat. Absolutely, just wait for the end. Yeah, it's very nice. Well, that fireplace it looks nicer and nicer the more I look at it. I'm almost Tempted to just inch a little bit closer and maybe uh, maybe just go for it. I'd cozy up to that cheek. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I think that ends another spooky, spooky, spooky episode of our spooky, spooky Halloween month-long fest travaganza. Uh, I think we're coming up on the last Friday of the month, are we not? Yeah. Halloween's is, is my sense of time distorted? Because no, you're right. Not. A week from now is Halloween. Fantastic. So I figured out how time works in reality. So that would mean that the topic of the next uh, episode will be another favorite of mine, Room 31, which is truly the most grim and grisly and ghastly and gregarious room in the entire maze. It is the perfect capper to our month-long celebration of all that is terrifying and disquieting. In That's a very cold room, right? I would say it's probably the coldest room in the maze. Yeah, very chilly. Yeah. Very so chilly. enjoy your time by the fire, folks, because next time you're going to get chilled to the very bone. Yeah, you're going to wish you're going to wish that big terrifying face were in room 31. That would be a relief and a comfort. Well, I guess that's it. You want to sing us out? Let it go, oh, here I stand, and here I fall, let the storm rage on, the cold